and we're live and Susan Schloss welcome to the shame free zone I'm so happy to be over on your Facebook feed today and we're going to be talking about money and how it intersects with relationships and also with our spiritual path and later he's going to treat us to a violin improvisation my heart is so ready to hear your beautiful music <laughs> thank you so much for having me i'm really glad that you're here um your people know who you are but this is also going to be going up on my youtube it's going to be going over on my facebook page at some point so i want to make sure that i introduce our viewers to you um and as i understand it you're very passionate about facilitating breakthroughs in our relationship with money which is is actually a place where we experience a lot of shame and you're a certified money coach and you combine some really interesting things that i've never heard anybody doing before <laughs> so you've got the financial expertise and the intuitive inspiration um, and you guide your clients to ground their spiritual into the material that is so awesome that's actually what i do through sex but you're doing it through money so it's amazing um and that that opens the door to greater prosperity in all levels and that that makes total sense to me that it would but i can't wait to learn more about how we actually are able to accomplish that you've got over 20 years in the financial services industry susan that's a lot um you've worked as an investment specialist an operations manager and you've built a six-figure bookkeeping business i mean seriously who does that that's amazing <laughs> You're kind of like a walking advertisement for your services. Um, you're committed to doing your part to change the system of dominance and oppression to one of equity and inclusion. That is such an important conversation for us to have around money because money does create a lot of power. Um, and particularly like when we're talking about relationships and couples, like who makes more money, that can become very problematic. So I'm looking forward to getting your insights on that as well. And you offer powerful tools to create deep shifts in a supportive environment of compassion and respect. And you aspire to facilitate transformation for anyone who struggles with money. So um, I know where I'd really like to start, Susan, if it's okay with you, is with the topic of money and shame. Because even just saying those two words together, and I'm the shame-free zone, I find myself kind of going, uh, I could just feel, feel a little tremulous around some shame issues around money. It really doesn't matter if I've made a lot of money or a little bit of money. It seems like that shame is, is kind of there all the time. So can you tell us a little bit about why you think we have shame around our relationship with money? Well, shame in general gets passed down to us from our parents. And I know you must look at these things in your work as well. And so much of what is operating with our money dynamics is in the nervous system from the imprints we got as children. And shame is a part of that. That's, that's a big part of it. And the other thing is that our culture is so money oriented and your value is associated with how much you have, is associated with your success and which we know isn't true, and yet those messages are so strong. So that can bring up shame for people. I just had someone this morning feeling ashamed because he didn't feel he had really accomplished the mastery with his money that he should, or that his father thought he should. And so a lot of shame can come up around that. Like, you know, Susan, I'm thinking about how, for me, growing up in my father's household, and my father was very uh, domineering, oppressive, and actually abusive, but um, I remember him saying to me something that was really pivotal in my relationship with money. He said, um, when you start making the money around him, maybe somebody will care what you think. And it was really saying to me that my opinions only mattered if I had money. And, you know, unfortunately, in my first marriage, I went on to kind of replicate that pattern. It was a subconscious thing. I didn't realize I was doing it, but I was making um, about twice as much money 
easily twice as much money as my husband was. And I oftentimes felt like that meant that I had more decision-making power in the right. Can you talk about that a little bit, about how that um, dominator system can infect our personal relationships? Absolutely. People who have a lot of money might feel like there's a sense of entitlement. And definitely what I've seen in relationships is when the woman is making more money, she can feel very irritated if the man isn't kind of living up to her expectations around that or doesn't have the ambition that she has. So I do see that dynamic uh, frequently. And so people... Yeah. You know, you know, it's interesting. I actually enjoyed making more money than my husband, but I think it's because I thought that meant I got to be the boss. Yeah, it can absolutely give you that sense of power. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Susan, when we're talking about the shame thing, I intentionally walked away from a six-figure income to, to go live in the woods uh, for eight years and uh, make very, very little money and just reconnect mm -hmm. with nature and... Mm -hmm. um, it was such an important part of my spiritual development. But I notice sometimes that I'll even feel some shame about walking away from money. Have you ever experienced that in any of your clients? I don't know if I've experienced that specific dynamic, but it makes sense if you have that strong message of your value being associated with how much you make. And I, I feel like that was your soul calling to integrate that piece and just bring it up, really, that you're, you're divide, you know, separating yourself from the money to see who you are. And oh, like, oh, I think it just coached me, and I really liked it. That's that's great. I hadn't thought about it that way. Like I intentionally subjected myself to some of that shame, so that I could become have a better sense of my value as a person, as separate from how much money I make. Is, am I hearing you right? Yeah, and heal that shame. Yeah. yeah, it has to come up before we can heal it. Right? Yeah. I like to think of those eight years on the mountain. It's kind of, I know it was a mountain, not a lake, but I still think of it as my Walden Pond. So it's like, what a beautiful thing to do. What an incredible thing to give yourself that time. That's great. I wrote a book and um, transitioned into relationship coaching and, and um, just so felt so grounded. I mean, I was so connected to nature. I always knew when it was going to snow or rain or, I mean, I could anticipate that stuff before it happened. That's so awesome. And then you've been able to create abundance from this place of groundedness and connection to nature, connection to a more authentic you. Yeah. yeah. And that's real abundance. Yes, it is. And, um, and abundance doesn't always come in exactly the way we expect it to. Have you helped your clients to understand that? Because I know sometimes uh, people actually want to see dollars and cents in their bank account, but then sometimes they negate the home they're living in or the car they're driving or, you know, just all the other abundance that's in their life, even health and love. Mm hmm Definitely. And that's where the spiritual practices and spiritual principles come in. So the gratitude practice is probably the key to connecting with true abundance. And like you're saying, really acknowledging the beauty and what we do have. That's the foundation as long as we're focused on what we don't have or where we think we're lacking. That's not keeping the doors open to the flow. Well, before we go into that, can we just back up a little bit and maybe you can give us some tips on how we heal our shame around money? Absolutely. So one of the money archetypes, the one that comes to mind here is the victim. And so that is a part of us that's really hard to look at because it's so vulnerable and nobody wants to think of themselves as a victim. But a lot of times the shame is connected to that victim place where we don't feel value, we feel powerless. 
And the healing around that dynamic is, of course, loving ourselves, but giving that victim a little voice, giving her some attention, giving her some love. There's probably anger behind it, too. And so practicing something like the Ho'oponopono prayer. I'm sorry. Give me. Thank you. Yeah, say, it, say it again, please. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. Yeah. And do it for yourself. And doing it for each one of your parents or any significant adult from your childhood that has had an influence on your money relationship. Yeah. Yeah. That's lovely. Oh, uh, thank you. And when your clients are having problems in their relationship around money, what, what are some of the problems that you're most likely to see? A lot of times people have different patterns around money. So one person might be very conservative and fearful, and the other person might be more happy-go-lucky, more of a spender. So that's the most challenging dynamic. And so then the person who is the tyrant money type gets really controlling around the one who is the fool or has that fool operating. Ah. There's a lot of discord that can happen there. So are we say tyrant and fool as in F-O-O-L? Yes. Aha, that's cute. <laughs> I, almost, I almost expect to see uh, a tarot card come out on that. <laughs> Yeah. The fool and the tyrant. Yeah. Yes. Hmm. Yeah, well, that sounds like my um, last marriage, actually. Really? <laughs> and which side were you on if you oh, could... definitely the tyrant? Yeah. <laughs> definitely the tyrant. But yeah, my husband was just like, you know, if he got thirty thousand dollars, he just wanted to go out and buy a third car. And I'm like, what about the roof? Um, so, so I, I was more like thinking long-term investment and practicality and he was like, let's go on a vacation. Let's go scuba diving. Yeah. Yeah. It can create a lot of stress. So when you can understand where each other are coming from and origins of those patterns, it can help to bring some compassion to the conversation. And a lot of times people can meet in the middle. Yeah. So, you know, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about some of the financial stress that people have been going through since the pandemic. Um, I know now with the couples I work with, they've had a lot more stress because they're at home all the time with each other and sometimes with the children too. Um, so there's a lot of, of uh, opportunity to get into arguments. I, I'm not in your line of work. So I don't know if the people that you coach around money are having problems specific to uh, the pandemic, but I sure like to hear about it if they are. There's certainly been some ups and downs for people initially, especially where business just dropped off for a lot of people who were healers, seeing people in person, for example. Uh, a lot of people have been able to adapt if they were working jobs. It hasn't really made that much difference. And so some people have done incredibly well during this time. I've actually had some of the best months of my money coaching career. So I, I, it, last year was a good year for me. <laughs> but again, anger management. <laughs> so I would imagine people were kind of in a tailspin and, and so they probably needed more help from you. Do you think that's true? Yeah, definitely having the support of the money coaching and coming back to that trust that we're taken care of, that we've seen ups and downs before, we're going to make it through this. And all the government help has made a, you know, made it really much easier for people too. Mm -hmm. Had to learn the skill of applying for grants and stuff. So that's been that's been a stress in and of itself. I think what you named about having kids at home has probably had the biggest impact for the people in my circle and just upheaval in their work lives and managing 
having that energy in their space and trying to focus, it's much more challenging. Totally. So, okay. So what are the, like, I don't know, the top three problems that couples have around money besides, so I'm here and we have like the tyrant and the fool. So somebody who wants to spend a lot and who wants to kind of control the, the flow of the money. What, maybe two other things that couples deal with around money? One thing that comes up often is the kind of codependency with children and trying to figure out where those boundaries are, especially as they're approaching retirement. People get a charge, get a lot of joy out of taking kids out for a big meal or you know, hosting things and paying for everything, paying for the travel expenses. Well, at a certain point, they start to feel it's unrealistic, but they don't really know how to navigate changing that pattern. So that's something I've seen people really make some changes around. That's one. And then another is being able to come together on decisions. <clears throat> and one couple I worked with, they both had a lot of that fool money type. And so they just get excited about something and jump into it and spend. And so they had to come together in a different way and recognize that they also had a goal of planning for their future. Yeah, right. I mean, there's, there's something to be grateful for, actually. If you and your partner are kind of on opposite sides of the money spectrum because you can balance each other. But if you're both one extreme or the other, then right. um, there's not going to be any balance. It's true. I've also seen where people are butting heads on, in the other direction where they're both really the warrior money type and they're both really um, goal oriented but they have different values. So when there's a values clash, that can definitely affect the ability to come together on important subjects like buying a home. Or... How, would, how would somebody figure out what their money values are? Like, do they just sit down and talk about it? Or is there some kind of, some, a series of questions that a, uh, a couple can sit down and talk about? Like, yeah, um, I'm just, that's, I mean, that, that would have been a helpful uh, conversation for me to have early on in my marriage. Like, what are, what are our money values? Yeah, I have people just make a list of all their values. And to do that, understanding how you spend your time, what you enjoy doing, um, what you think about the most, what's important to you, and then identifying out of those which ones are money related and it's surprising sometimes how many really do connect back to money that's an interesting um assertion i and i or idea i i think that money seems to connect with a lot of things i mean like even today just the care of my mother who has advanced uh, alzheimer's um i'm i'm always like struggling with the, what's the best care for her and also um, how much can we afford and, and these are like horrible things to be thinking about when you love somebody and I, I think that can evoke shame in us too just like you were talking about people's children they want to they want to take care of their children but then some of that is based in codependency and some of it is you know it's it's lovely and it's, it's taking care of the people that we um, care about. So financially, what are the bottom lines that we should look at that help us understand when we are maybe over giving um, and tipping over into that codependent place and, 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 and when we're just really loving and caring for the people that matter most to us? It's a tough one. But if you feel that you're being self-sacrificing and your needs aren't getting met, that could be an indication. I think with children, it's super challenging to figure out where the line is. You know, I would never pass judgment on anybody for their decisions, but I do encourage people to look at, 
are your needs getting met? And if they're not, do the kids really need that? You know, or is it more like keeping up with the neighbors, keeping up, especially like I live in Marin County and I hear from parents that, oh, you have to spend all this money on sports and wow. tribute to the schools. And so that pressure can feel very real, but if it's just an image thing, then maybe looking at it again. Yes. Yeah. I would have to say too, with an aging parent who is becoming uh, more cognitively compromised every day, it's like having a child, you know? So when I was married, I, I, I um, co-parented toddlers and stepchildren. And I often feel a lot of the same emotions um, with my mother. And, you know, I know there's a lot of um, adults who are now in this role of taking care of their parents because um, dementia is becoming more and more common and it's striking people at an earlier and earlier age. Do you maybe counsel your clients to kind of prepare for that? Like how to, you know, how are they going to care for their parents as they get older? I think it's important for people to think about that as a potential reality. I think it's a hard one for people to face. Um, the couple I was working with recently, one of the couples, both, both of them had parent issues around money. And the woman really needed to step in, but she didn't feel like maybe she should because her dad still had some ability to understand things. And so that's a tricky one to know when do I step in? How much do I step in? I say step in as soon as things are not going smoothly, step in because it's not going to get better. I could testify to that. <laughs> having the utmost compassion for yourself because it's a huge amount of energy that you're needing to hold that for your parent. Yeah. And if your own finances are going to be part of that, you know, question, then really looking at what your needs are for planning for your future and just making sure that they're in a place where they're cared for well. And, you know, the truth is that we have to be proactive around their care, no matter what, even in the best of places. Well, you know, it's my mom. Um, my dad has already passed on, and as I indicated earlier, he was um, an abusive father. But um, my mom, I'm kind of like, I just think about how she went through labor pains and nursed me and changed all those diapers. And um, it makes it a little easier to show up for her. Um, Absolutely. Love her. Yeah, we want to be there for them for sure. So it's just finding how to take care of ourselves. And yes. And I, and I think that's what you're saying about money. Um, we want to be maybe in a, a partnership with each other around our money so that we're not the tyrant or the fool. Because when I hear you talk about the tyrant and the fool, and I think I reflect on my, my first marriage, one of the things that I think about is how um, I was acting like the, the um, controlling parent, and he was mm -hmm. acting kind of like the rebellious little boy. So instead of taking responsibility for his part in the partnership, you know, he's kind of just wants to have fun. And I'm I'm the buzzkill. I'm the one who's saying, no, we need to be practical and intelligent about this. Um, do you see that pattern play out with couples where one is, you know, like the person that you called the fool is actually kind of acting like a child and the other person's having or feels like they have to show up as the parent well usually by the time they come to money coaching there's an awareness of some impulsive spending and a need to get a little more grounded okay. but definitely i see that dynamic and but uh probably more often i see the tyrant not really aware of how they might be contributing to the dynamic because it feels so right and they might be right totally 
I I understand why that would be the case. Yeah, because you're like Jacob, but I have I have logic and math on my side. Exactly. <laughs> well, since it, you really want to ground our relationship with the material uh, in the spiritual, or vice versa, both. I, I kind of see it as circular. And, sure. Uh, there, but can you say a little bit more about that, and what's the value in that? Hmm. When people are struggling with money, there's a sense of maybe, um, you know, that feeling of powerlessness, a uh, feeling of not trusting, a feeling of needing to control. And so when you bring the spiritual into it, which often doesn't occur to people, no matter how spiritual they are, then that can really provide a foundation of security and that understanding that our security doesn't actually come from money, ultimately. Say more about that. So money is an energy and there is a sense of security and when there's more money, for sure. But it is temporary. You know, we don't have control over it, really. And so making sure that our sense of security, inner security, is grounded in spirituality. Also, feeling the spiritual aspect of money, money being an energy. And so when you're open spiritually, you can be open to that flow of abundance. And also the other piece that comes into it is uh, there are a number of spiritual aspects that I bring in, but service so when we're approaching our work with the heart of service then it's easier to let go of the results the financial results and trust that if i'm in service i'm going to be shown the right next steps if i'm connected spiritually and then that will lead to abundance I like that, the whole idea of being in service mode, because that's really where I live with my clients, so much so that I have sometimes forgotten to bill them. Um, I have to like remind myself, oh, that's right, I'm going to cage to this. I need to, I need to go charge their credit card. Um, so even that, I suppose, requires a little bit of balance. But I, I do think for myself, being in that place of really... Uh, loving what I do and wanting to be of service to people and feeling that that is tied to my spiritual path. It's not just about how I put money in the bank. It's really about how I fulfill the reason that I incarnated that, um, that creates this beautiful flow that I don't really have to spend too much time uh, thinking about. Is that how your understanding of how it works? Yeah, that's absolutely gorgeous. And we're very fortunate. You know, I'm the same way. I'm living my purpose here. And so I'm very blessed to be doing what I love doing and being of service that way. So, well, I'm glad for what you're doing. And I'm wondering is this, is, can you, I would love to hear your violin. Just love to. But before we do, can you just tell us a little bit about? Why a violin and what does it have to do with money? Violin is the most like a voice. And so there's, there's a lot of capacity for emotional expression in the violin. And I've been playing since I was seven years old. So I have a lifetime of playing the violin. I've been through, you know, college music degree and then periods where I did nothing but improvise. So what I love to do is to do a channel, channeling the music through the violin. It's something that I would say is a gift that I have to just bring that spirit through the violin for as a healing tool. And it ties in with the money coaching in that it helps us connect to our heart, helps us connect to that spirituality that is so important as a foundation for staying open to prosperity. Oh, please lay it on us.
Beautiful. I felt transported. <laughs> you said that violins are the closest thing we have to a voice. What could you help us understand what that was and why it felt so emotional? I mean, like, I don't have words for it, and maybe you don't either, and that's okay. We don't have to overanalyze every aspect of life. Um, that was a beautiful gift, just as it is. But if there is some way that you could help us understand uh, what that was and why, it, what, what kind of feelings it evokes in us, um, I'm certainly open to hearing about that. I started by placing the bow on the open string D and just let the inspiration come through for what was next. And what I noticed is that it was a very hopeful melody that came in and the element of beauty, which is really associated with prosperity. If you know the goddess Lakshmi in the Hindu tradition, she's the goddess of beauty and prosperity. And so beauty is part of the prosperity conversation. And so that was what wanted to come through was just this pure sound of beauty, of hope, and love. Listen, I really feel like you just brought us back to how we opened this conversation, which was about gratitude. And, I, and it, to me, it seems like when we are grateful about the beauty in our lives, then we open to a divine flow. And, um, and it seems that your violin is one beautiful way to open to that flow. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would agree with that. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am so appreciating our time together. Um, I'm going to be listing all of your links below uh, my Facebook feed and my YouTube. And, but um, if you want to take this final few minutes to just tell people how they can contact you, um, then please do. Yes, so I'm at moneywisdomcoach.com and visit my website there and you can join my list and you'll find out about events that are coming up. I do webinars regularly and classes and programs everything that people need to really make some changes that are calling to them. And um, you can take the money type quiz at my website as well. Yeah. I'm going to take that quiz. <laughs> Where you are today. It's not your personality. It's not set in stone, but it'll give you a sense of where you are right now. That is great. So the money type quiz is on your website. Yes. All right. All right. I always like to ask this one last question, Susan. Um, and that is, what is the one question that you wish I asked that I didn't? Let's see. Um, maybe just to share a little bit about my own journey. Because I think people like to hear that you shared a lot about your own yeah. journey with your mom and uh, I think that that would personalize it a little for people so for myself please uh, growing up in a dysfunctional household with abuse as well and sexual abuse from a very young age had a really big impact on my self-esteem which we didn't name it as self-esteem but that shame and self-esteem are tied together so closely so my survival was to stay small, to stay safe. And I just kept everything really small for a lot of my life. So my journey has been to heal that history, which I've done tremendous amount of healing and I feel very free today. And I feel very open to receiving and taking up more space and being more visible. So that's been my own journey. I really appreciate what you just shared, Susan, because uh, I'm also an incest survivor. And it was also my safe place to be small. I wasn't always small because I'm a rebellious, outspoken Aries, but um, 
safe. If I wanted to be safe, I, I had to make myself small to the point of sometimes trying not to breathe too deeply. Mm -hmm. So again, working with you today, I just got another connection, which is that sometimes when I have not wanted to show up in my profession and monetarily in as big a way as I'm capable of, it's been that old programming of staying small so that I don't get hurt. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just, I'm giving you a virtual hug. <laughs> and I'm so glad that we um, have this time together. And I'm really grateful for the gifts that you bring into this world. I, I think it's so important that we take money out of the dominant patriarchal paradigm and put it into something that is spiritual and um, life affirming. And you're doing that work, Susan, so thank you. Thank you.